I can't even remember when exactly my interest in preserving and maintaining the environment became a very integral part of my functioning. But it was very early on, and I think a lot of it had to do with my appreciation for what we had up here, up north, and our integration with this environment and utilization of the resources we have and an understanding that we had a call to preserve that and to protect that. I love my city. We all love our city. We all here. We have to care about our water. We have to keep our water clean. I love to go out to the riverfront and the river walk. It's beautiful down there and down in Hart Plaza. It's really nice, a great view. When you think of all the ways that we use water, obviously to cook, to bathe, to recreate in, but the most intimate use we have of water is we drink it, we consume it. How careful we are about so many other elements of our life, about what we eat, how much sun we are exposed to, and obviously one thing we probably overlook or we don't think deeply enough about is the very water we are drinking. And is it safe? Is it clean? Is it free of chemicals that can ultimately harm us? You know, I've always been concerned about the environment. And, and issues that, that affect me and affect you know, the beautiful natural resources that we have. But I also consider myself a very practical person. I ran an environmental education camp to get kids out in nature, to encourage them to you know, be concerned about their environment, be aware of it, and obviously to take care of it. We care about clean water because it creates healthy human beings and we at the trout farm are raising trout. We want to raise a healthy product that we sell to people. We also care about our environment. Every ounce of water that comes through our farm also leaves our farm. We are the stewards of that and take that very seriously. When I look at this issue of proper disposing of pharmaceuticals, I view this um, from the, the viewpoint of not only a mom, but a health professional. I am a nurse and I am in a nursing instructor as well. You know, you see these things in the newspaper, uh, pollution here, pollution there, drugs in our water, and, and really didn't pay a lot of attention to it, quite honestly, at that point. Oftentimes families would say, can you please take care of these medications that we have? that we used for our loved one and we really don't want them in the home anymore and would actually ask me to get rid of all of their outdated, expired, unneeded, unwanted medications that they would have. And due to their lack of knowledge, they tend to just stockpile these medications or they flush them down the drains, pour them down the sink, you know, and that can be very dangerous, just leaving them around. A kid could ingest it, a pet, anything like that. Standard practice at that time was to flush uh, any controlled substances down the toilet, obviously so that they would be completely removed from the home, and, and otherwise just throwing everything else in the garbage and mixing it with cat litter or with coffee grounds or something. Where does all that go and how is, how is that affecting the water that we're drinking out of a glass right now? A lot of people are surprised if you go and, and tell a person that there's ibuprofen and, and acetaminophen and birth control medications in that stream, they act surprised. I was so absolutely surprised that in this country in 2007, 2008, there was so little being done on this issue. We keep up on the literature and there was papers coming out of Europe where there are some heart medications, other pharmaceuticals were showing up in, in European water, uh, water resources. And that really kind of put a light bulb up for us that, that thinking about the U.S. perspective, we had no idea what pharmaceuticals or contaminants emerge concern, which include hormones, um, plasticizers, things we use in our daily lives, really had no idea 
if those compounds are even present here in the U.S. Certainly if they're in Europe, one would think, there, no reason to think they wouldn't also be in the U.S., but we had no data to confirm that. So we started this national reconnaissance, kind of a national assessment, looking at streams we thought we most likely find these compounds. So we did 130 streams across about 30 states. So we really made sure we captured different geography, different hydrologic settings, different climate, and looked for about 90 different compounds. And so what we found is above the wastewater treatment plant, there's the mass of fish is less, but it's better diversity. Uh, we're downstream here. If you just looked at the, the mass of fish, there's a lot of fish, particularly carp uh, and so forth, tolerant species that can handle, say, the nutrient load that's coming in here and the other contaminants. It's going to take some time before the research is all completed, but what we do know sends a message that there are clearly some concerns on these low levels that we're seeing uh, in our drinking water supplies, our lakes, rivers, and streams, basically in the Great Lakes. We're very concerned with the chemicals, pharmaceuticals, personal care products, and pesticides that end up in our water systems, and our wastewater treatment plants are not designed to treat such chemicals in the water. The safety of the drinking water supply in Alpena and elsewhere in the state of Michigan is, is regulated, highly regulated. We monitor continuously as, as a plant is operating, we're constantly monitoring, we're, we're collecting back tea samples, we're, um, we know that the water is safe to drink. We don't know what the impact of, of small concentrations of various chemicals is going to be in the long term. Now the plants themselves, they're not doing anything wrong. They're not out of compliance. You know, they're doing what they've always been intended to do. They're removing bacteria, they're removing nitrates, but these pharmaceuticals and these emerging contaminants are just never part of the equation. Fisheries are being impacted in ways where the fish are developing feminine features as a result of the endocrine disruptors that are part of the pharmaceutical releases that we're seeing throughout the world, actually. So in this lab setting, we are using very low concentrations of pesticides and chemicals, uh, uh, pharmaceuticals, and exposing it to Daphnia, which are water fleas. And these species are keystone species and they would affect the entire ecosystem because higher animals, fish, would depend on them. And in this lab setting, we're actually seeing a lot of behavioral effects on Daphnia exposed to very low concentrations of pharmaceuticals. Well, there have been studies in Europe that are showing impacts to amphibians as well and frogs. You know, it, it has an impact that is showing in the environment already. And as we see this continued throughout uh, time and possibly seeing the levels increase, we could see even greater impacts. So the first concern would be, am I getting unintended exposures to pharmaceuticals by consuming fish that have been exposed to these compounds either through a waste or treatment plant or other potential sources? Also in terms of sport, if there's an impact to the fish and fish populations, they may not be able to catch the big lunkers or even the types of fish they want because the environment has been impacted from these exposures. So when you throw it in the garbage, it's gonna to go to the landfill and we're doing a study right now. We've done a national landfill leachate study and showing that these compounds are in the leachate. And a lot of times, particularly in modern landfills, the leachate is collected and what happens to it? It's brought back to the waste or treatment plant. So it, it may be a slower process to the plant, but it's still a pathway that's going right to the plant. Are you solving anything? Certainly you are in terms of for safety, for misuse, but I, it's still, I'm not quite sure we're really solving anything in terms of preventing environmental contamination. There should definitely be programs where we can collect these pharmaceuticals. And that would be extremely helpful to preserving our ecosystem and our environment. I think what a lot of the states are doing, though, are, are making sure that a couple of messages are coming out. Um, one of the bigger messages is safety, and just having uh, unused pharmaceuticals in your home are a significant problem. At the same time that we were formulating our own plan of how we could deliver such a program to our communities, and while we were thinking of and concerned very directly with the environmental impact, particularly our water. Uh, another issue is coming to the surface in our communities, and that is illicit drug use. We know that in 2012, nationwide, one out of four teens reported that they had misused or abused prescription medication. 
So it's a significant issue. We also know that of that group, over 40% of those teens indicated that they got the medication from the family medicine cabinet. So that accessibility is, a, is an issue that we need to address. So our, our question was, can we do something about this? Our first step was really to look and see if people had recourse at all. Were there options for individuals? And frankly, no, not in the area where we lived. The option was, as we discussed before, flushing down the toilet or throwing into the garbage. And that was a standard protocol at the time. There were truly no other options. So in choosing a name for our organization, because we are the Great Lakes State in Michigan, that seemed like a natural go-to. So the name of our organization became Great Lakes Clean Water. Although we understand, and we understood at that time, and even more so now, that this isn't just a problem limited to the Great Lakes area. Early on, we recognized that because the prevention of prescription drug misuse and abuse was our agenda. We recognize that individuals who make up the communities of our Great Lakes, um, they have different priorities and values. We're a real diverse group and so we looked to other partners who had the same end goal which was to create awareness for the need for appropriate disposal to creation of sustainable and accessible disposal sites. And we found our partner with Great Lakes Clean Water Organization. So we began to brainstorm about what would be workable. And we had many different concerns. Number one, we wanted whatever course we took to be something that would be very available to people, that would be safely done, that would be safely controlled, and that the individuals who were dropping medications off, if there were going to be drop-off points, could be assured that their medications were being disposed of properly. In the research in designing the program, we had to do some research. Okay, once you collect the unused, unwanted drugs, what is the best way to dispose of them? And actually, back then, we didn't know. We had to do the research. At that time, EPA didn't have a position on it. Most state regulatory agencies did not have a position on properly disposing of unused, unwanted drugs. High temperature incineration at that point was recommended by the World Health Organization as the most environmentally and thorough way of destroying unused and unwanted drugs. We're taking our waste in and creating steam and electricity energy from, from a, a waste stream. Same, same with this, instead of contamination, it's a good thing for the environment. Everybody should be doing that. That's why we, we enjoy partnering with Great Lakes Clean Water make sure that the drugs are uh, managed in a way that they can't be reused any further, and, and then get them to an incinerator, and a lot of it goes to uh, uh, a couple of incinerators that are in Michigan, basically, that uh, provide that type of service. So out of Great Lakes Clean Water Organization, we formed the particular drug collection program called Yellow Jug Old Drugs. We wanted something that would be unique and memorable and very visible, so a yellow jug is very visible. We took this issue then to local pharmacists and actually invited, I think, about a half a dozen of them to, to talk about this, to talk about what could be done locally. We had some ideas and we wanted their ideas as well. We just tossed around a lot of ideas and I think the second meeting we were still trying to get through some of the particulars and we just decided let's do it. Um, let's get something started. Uh, let's, let's try and make an impact on this and it's, it's grown and it's made I think a fantastic difference. Pharmacists are the most accessible health profession that's out there and uh, because of that being an accessible health care professional uh, it's a place where many, many people in the state go to, uh, if, if not weekly, on a monthly basis. So the, the logical place to get rid of the medications uh, is actually at the pharmacy. 
and it is simple as people taking their unwanted drugs, taking them to the pharmacy if they need help sorting through them. The pharmacist will do that for them. These are pharmacies that are available in grocery stores, certainly pharmacies. So uh, the disposal sites are readily available to people. They are very interested that they be disposed of properly. And so we are very grateful to them that they so very readily paired with us, understood the importance of it, and have truly partnered with us in promoting this program and in spreading information about it and making the service available to their customers. Pharmacists needed to have a program that was very regimented, very well controlled, and absolutely no room for error. No pharmacist and we did not want to be involved in something that we could not explicitly say we're picking up this and proving that we're disposing of it. I've been very amazed at the number and the growth of uh, the Yellow Jug program here in, here in the state and pharmacists have uh, reported back to us that they appreciate how the program operates and more importantly the fact that they're providing uh, an opportunity for people to get rid of the unwanted medications. When this program first started four years ago, I think I was thinking very locally that this was a wonderful thing we were bringing to Northeast Michigan. And now it is a full statewide program in Michigan and we have extended out through the states of Wisconsin and Illinois as well and plan to encompass all the Great Lakes states and beyond. The Yellow Jug program I, I feel should and could be used in every state. And that is my hope for it, that it does spread to, to every state in the United States. It is a unique program. There is no other program like it in our whole country in that it is statewide, it is sustainable, it is ongoing, it's safe collection, and the medications are disposed of in the best technology we have available to us today. I'm very happy to be a part of the Yellow Jug program um, because I feel it's a proactive program helping prevent something instead of having to go in and clean something up. Really trying to help minimize contamination because once it's in the environment uh, it's a lot harder to do so prevention is really what needs to be done because if you treat, treatment is, is kind of your last resort kind of thing. You want to prevent versus tr having to treat with it after it's already there. When I think of it in very relevant terms, like what does this drug collection mean? What has it done? We have to date in the last four years collected and properly disposed of 32 tons of pharmaceuticals. So what I see for this program is that it will become more or less a household term, that people will understand that they have resources. I think the term yellow jug, old drug will become uh, a verb that people use, that we can yellow jug old drug these substances. And I think it will become very commonplace, that people will understand very widely that this is a resource available to them, and not only available, that the, but that they should utilize this resource anytime they're disposing of pharmaceuticals of any sort, whether it's an over-the-counter drug or whether it's a prescribed medication, that they all need to be disposed of properly. One step that folks could take today is to go home and look at their medicine cabinet. And if there are medications in there that they're not using, that they no longer need, to collect those medications up and take them to a local pharmacy that's participating in the Yellow Jug program. Moving forward, it will take all of us, the students, the pharmacists, doctors, outdoor enthusiasts, caregivers, people themselves who are disposing of these drugs to actually do it. If you're wondering where the nearest pharmacy is to you that has uh, participates with the Yellow Jug Old Drug Program, you can go on the website, www.greatlakescleanwater.org, and there is a map that you can click on that will show you where the nearest pharmacy is in the county that you reside. 
I would hope to see us five years from now that it's, of course I would dispose of my medication in an appropriate way. I, um, that's what I would hope to see is that it becomes commonplace. Okay, raise your hand if you drink water. We all drink water. We all should be supporting this. You know, this, this is an issue. There's, there's no left, there's no right, there's no blue, there's no red. This is something we are all concerned about. And it's something that, that, that we all agree on. We probably deal with 30, 40 people a week who bring medications in here. We're all very conscious about the environment and this is a huge part of it. And the consumer and the patient feel very good about being able to dispose of this in a proper way. From our standpoint, it gives us another opportunity to talk with patients about these issues and solve some problems. Up until recently, pharmacy students were not being educated on the proper disposal of drugs. I actually have not received any formal education on this issue. We haven't touched upon this topic at all. It is a really important part of their educational experience. We have made it a priority to do lectures and talks at pharmacy schools, and we hope that in the future this will become a part of their regular curriculum. Thousands of kids have caught their first fish here, and it's a wonderful, wonderful thing to, to witness and then to show them where their food comes from, what type of water that that food is raised in, and how important that that water is to the health of that fish, and how important that the health of that fish is to their body. And it's just a wonderful circle to show them. It's all very important for becoming a good steward of our natural resources. Well, I, I would hope that the public gets on board with this. The word gets out through Great Lakes Clean Water Organization. It's the right thing to do. Research has indicated that behavior change occurs when in relationship to how we view it with other people that, that we know. And so it's really important to have these conversations with your friends, your family, your colleagues. I'd just like to say that we're, we're very, very um, proud to be partners with um, the Great Lakes Clean Water Organization. Um, and uh, as far as I'm concerned, uh, they're true environmentalists. I connect with this problem very personally, and I, I think of our own life here and our history here at our cabin, that this has been handed down, and generation after generation has carefully cared for it and has passed it on to the next generation. And we not only assume, we expect that each generation will care for it and have the same regard for it. In the same way, we need to protect our natural resources and principally our water. And we not only currently, uh, this, this generation and the people here now today need to care for it and safeguard it, but we need to pass that responsibility on to generations to come. It does give us life. It gives all of our trout life. It then gives you life. And it, it's just a beautiful circle of life that, that we don't take for granted and, and could not have that circle without that water. Well, you need water to survive, and so, I mean, it's certainly water quantity is an issue in some areas, but water quality is another issue. So the more we put our stamp on the environment, the more potential there is to degrade the water. From our standpoint here in the pharmacy, we uh, fully support the yellow jug, old drugs, and would encourage patients to look into it if they're looking to dispose of old drugs, find a participating pharmacy, and let's help try and protect the Great Lakes. Let's get ahead of the curve. Let's be proactive on this one so it doesn't become a huge environmental negative issue. No matter where you live, no matter what age group you are in, it impacts everybody. This is vital to all of us as water is vital to our life and our vitality and our own sustainability. This program is vital to everybody. 
My hope for the future is that the thought of pouring a medication down the toilet would be unheard of, that the yellow jug would be recognizable on site to everyone. Everyone's gonna know about keeping our water safe and pure as it can be, as possible. That will be my hope for the future.